so, of course, the humanities, uh, the sciences, the uh, and psychology even uh, has musical implications. There are correlations, for example, in psychology with uh, interpersonal relationship dynamics. So if you've got a person who's represented by that note, and then you've got uh, a person who's represented by that note, <laughs> what do you have? You've got tension, right? You've got, you have tension. Uh, but the mother of that person walks in the room sounding like that. So you've got, you got those two people, but then you, the mother walks in and becomes a little bit more bearable, right? <laughs> so you've got all of these different dynamics that are sort of related and, or, or interrelated with uh, and can be explained in terms of uh, musicality, harmon harmony, tension, release. Uh, when you walk into a, a movie and you hear you kind of feel peaceful, uh, but you wouldn't hear that in a scene, in a chase scene. And if you saw a, a photograph on the screen of a, of a nice calm pond uh, with birds, and you heard, you know all is not as it seems. <laughs> so music has a way of, of, of shaping our perceptions, uh, and it's, it's, it's very far-reaching. Uh, my voicemail at home, if you call my home, uh, which many of you <laughs> know, it says, in life there are choices. You can choose to respond, or you can choose to react, or simply choose to improvise. <laughs> and, I, and it's funny, all of the, the different responses that I get. And most people say, say on the voicemail, I, I choose to, impro to improvise. So what do we do about the dilemma that we, we're in, in terms of the lack of, of arts in the schools? We improvise. Literally and figuratively, we have to, we have to improvise. Uh, so while we're waiting for all of the, the studies to be studied, the policy changes to be argued, the legislation to be drafted, politicians to be lobbied, to vote for changes that might filter down in time for our grandchildren or great-grandchildren to reap the benefits, in the meantime, we've got to improvise. Improvisation, we think of improvisation in a certain context. But I'd like to, uh, to remember the story of uh, Daryl Thompson, who's the son of Lucky Thompson, the sax player. He went to, uh, to take a guitar master's class with a, a private teacher who was a master uh, classical guitarist. And he knew that Daryl was a great jazz guitarist already, that he was a great composer and improvisational artist. <laughs> And so he sat Daryl down and he played him uh, a classical guitar piece that lasted about 20 minutes. So after it was over, he asked Daryl, he says, so uh, tell me what you heard. And Daryl is a really intellectual cat. He went into his, his long explanation about timing, about meter, about uh, contrast, about tone, pacing. And the guy shook his head and said, you didn't get it, did you? He said, listen again. So another 20 minutes invested while the guy goes and has a cigarette. So the guy gets back in the room and asks Daryl again, so what did you hear? And so by this time, Daryl is just completely dumbfounded, doesn't know what in the world this guy is, is talking about, what he's asking for. And so the guy says, didn't that just sound like a cat blowing over some changes? <laughs> so what he was inferring that this 
this classical composition, like most music, was created by improvisation that was simply documented and notated. And so what Daryl got from that was that rather than learning this repertoire, he's a composer, he's a creator, go create his own. <laughs> go create your own, grow your own gold. And so the challenge for you guys <coughs> is not only to bring jazz to your schools, but to bring your school to schools to jazz. And there are many ways to do that. Uh, we just talked about the Wednesday, the every second Wednesday uh, jam session at the Jazz Institute. This jam session is not, and I repeat, not just for music students. You need to bring your math students, your language students there to do their homework while they're listening to this music. If, in fact, the perception among young people is, is that jazz is the, the music of their grandfathers, what happens when the grandfathers are gone? If there's no exposure to the music? The future audience is gone. The future audience evaporates. So along with growing the, the musicianship, proficiency in the music, we've got to grow an appreciation for the music. That's paramount. It, it, that's the only way that this music is going to survive. Um, so there are many ways that you can get involved. Uh, you can be a doer. If you are the type of instructor who likes to that, like have hands-on on involvement, just like uh, George Hunter kept me after school, off the clock, when he had plenty of other things to do to, to show me basics on the piano. He did that for many students. He not only did that, but when his big band did gigs, he invited me on the gigs to help set up music stands and put out the music at the High Chaparral or at Club de Lisa. And he let me sit in on a couple numbers, take over the, the keyboard, you know, so it's, it's those kind of things that, that you can do as a, as a doer to, to help facilitate. Um, if you can't do, or, or in addition to doing, you can also be a supplier. And providing financial resources, human resources, or materials. Instead of trading in that old horn, how about gifting it to an interested guy uh, trumpet player, or sax player, or flute player, instead of uh, putting that old guitar or drum set on eBay, find a, a, a young student who's interested. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Phil Coran and I were talking about this kind of thing, and we just decided one summer that we were going to dedicate our entire summer to, uh, to creating a, a program that fostered uh, volunteerism among musicians. So we had about five, we had about ten teachers. We had a guitar teacher, we had a drum, percussion, I taught piano, we had a dance instructor, we, and believe it or not, we, we were focused in the uh, green, green area. The hardest part of it, all of it, was recruiting students. We passed out flyers at the Bud Billiken Parade, uh, but mothers were in, were interested, but they didn't have transportation to get the kids there. They just didn't. So there are all these obstacles to making things happen, and as you know, it's just it's just getting the logistics of, of a program going. Even if you have the, the instruments there, the Miles Davis Academy on the south side uh, is open. Has been open for a few years. We're donated a number of uh, string instruments that have been sitting in the closet collecting dust, about 18 instruments. How can you have a Miles Davis Academy without a music program? <laughs> but that's the, the state of affairs that's, that's, that's going on. 
So those are things that we have to change, and we can't wait uh, for something to happen from the top up. We've got to do it from the ground up. From the top down, rather. We have to do it from the ground up. Um, so I, I, I'm a proponent of a, adopting, finding a talented student, replace the instrument that you specialize in, and just adopting that child and, and giving them of your time one hour a week to develop, get them an instrument, whatever it takes, get them going. When I was in high school and in grade school, there, were, there was there were a proliferation of instruments. It was a non-issue. We were given the instruments to take home once we showed proficiency, a basic proficiency. So if that no longer exists, if you really want to make a difference, then that's that's the way you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to sort of take matters into your own hands. You can be an influencer and uh, simply by, uh, for example, uh, uh, you, there's a workshop uh, in the program today uh, about grant writing. So if you want to go that route, uh, influencing people to, to donate money to create programs, to write programs, whether it be after school or whether you want to incorporate it into your curriculum. Another idea is, is if kids are into hip hop, why not meet them where they're at? In other words, uh, if that's what they love, well, maybe give them assignments to write lyrics based on jazz artists, some of those artists that you know, just saw. And if they're going to sample music, have them sample jazz and have them to know the history of what they're sampling and to write about that. And give them grades for it. <laughs> give them incentive. Incentivize those kind of efforts. Uh, so there, there are many things that you can do which also fall under the category of innovation and, and creating strategies and methodologies by yourself thinking outside of the box. So there's a, one of my favorite quotes by Emerson, sow a thought and you reap an action, sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. Sow a character, and you reap a destiny. And so, I'd like to add one more to that. Sow a destiny, and you reap a legacy. And that legacy that Captain Walter Diet left, that list that we saw, and mind you, that was just a very partial list. He taught about 20,000 students. So it would be interesting to trace the uh, progress and the development of the students who we taught who didn't go into music and who developed in, in other ways. It be a very interesting study. So the legacies that you create for yourself are going to be the development of, of those students who are entrusted into your tutelage and care. Uh, we know that the lack of music education is a systemic problem. And so when the problem is systemic, uh, there, it requires a, a change management. Because you've got to be able to change behavior. Because as we see that once an action is established, it becomes habit. And so we've got to undo years of habitual behavior. And so I would say look into and, and study and explore ideas in change management. There are a lot of resources online. Just Google change management. And in doing that, you're going to create a, a shift in culture. Because right now, uh, the hip hop culture, and, and, and I'm not down on hip hop culture, mind you, because with what you have with with a rapper is basically a tap dancer with words. Because, uh, because they went really far because they were using elements that they had available to them. Uh, it's like a blind person whose sense of hearing uh, and feel develops more keenly because they can't see. So because these kids didn't have musical instruments, they went far into the technology. They, and, and sampling and aligning the music to a beat and, and rapping to it, it's all 
technical word. 